ahead and get started so we can be started on time for everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming today. Uh, this session we're going to be kind of a discussion panel um, on memory loss strategies. Uh, my name is Brianne Heimbeck. I am a social worker from Idaho. I work uh, for the Southern Idaho Affiliate. I also lead a young adult support group for the HDSA, and I also work in um, hospice and home health care. So I work with a lot of uh, patients in with dementia, both in their homes as well as in facilities, uh, along with a lot of other um, different uh, progressive diagnoses and uh, chronic disease and you know hospice diagnoses. So we're going to just introduce ourselves first. And my name is Lori Travis. I am a caregiver. My husband has Huntington's disease. I'm also the president of the Georgia chapter of the HDSA. Um, I got involved in Huntington's disease. I didn't know a thing about it until 2017 when Blake was diagnosed. His mom was misdiagnosed with Parkinson's, we believe. She had passed away prior to us finding out about Blake's um, um, I guess his um, his his confirmation, and so um, since then I've been leaning into the community, and um, so now here I am as the chapter president. Mm -hmm. and, Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Um, my name is Felicia Goldstein. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist at Emory in the Department of Neurology. I've been at Emory for many years, um, and I work very closely uh, in several years now with the. Movement Disorders Program at Emory, so Dr. Factor, a lot of the doctors that um, have been at the conference today, um, and that's that's my story, <laughs> pretty much. Thanks. So, um, I know if you've all attended sessions, we probably have a couple disclaimer slides that are just the typical. This is live streamed. Um, it will be available after the conference within a couple weeks. Um, again, we always encourage you to consult with your primary care provider. This is for information purposes. We know everybody's situation is different. Um, I do want to say that we would love for you to have questions. You know, the app, um, put your questions in there from the start of the session. Um, if you came here today and had something that you were hoping to gain from this session, put it in there. Um, if it's not something that we cover, but we feel like we can address it, we really want this to be an interactive um, session as much as possible. Um, if you have a real life example, if there's something that you or a loved one um, is dealing with or something you've dealt with before that has to do with memory loss, please put that question in there. Because again, we would love for this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and including those viewers online, I guess, because now I'm realizing we're live streaming. So um, even if you're online, you know. So um, so anyway, so the more of those kind of real life examples or, again, those burning questions that you wanted to have answered, please feel free to put them in throughout the session. And we'll try and address them as we go if they're pertinent to that information. And we'll also then have um, question and answer time to um, address some of those at the end. So it's just that other disclaimer about, all right, so. So we're, we're going to start off um, with, uh, Felicia's going to tell us a little bit about just kind of what is dementia, um, because memory loss falls into that. Um, and then we'll kind of go into a couple more definitions, just so that we're operating all off the same kind of basis and foundation of information. OK, so dementia we refer to as a sort of an umbrella global um, term. It refers to an acquired, uh, an acquired syndrome of decline in memory and other cognitive functions. So memory, language, reasoning, problem solving, etc. cetera. Um, it's um, an acquired syndrome, meaning that you're not born with dementia, obviously. It's something that you get at some point in life. And it occurs in, a, in an alert patient, so it's not due to delirium. It's something more enduring than that. It is progressive. It can be progressive and disabling. Progressive meaning there are some treatable causes of dementia, such as B12 deficiency, thyroid disease. So uh, as clinicians, we always try to rule out things that might be causing the dementia because we may be able to treat it and reverse it. It's not a normal aspect of aging. So even in our 20s, research has shown that there are normal changes that occur in aging. For example, um, uh, speed of processing slows. 
word finding, a little bit more trouble coming up with the names of things, a little bit more spaciness and forgetfulness. That's just normal with aging. In dementia, it's more than what's expected for age. So it's, it's more of a serious loss of ability. And um, again, it's different from normal cognitive lapses, you know, losing your keys, uh, forgetting where your cell phone is, things like that. It's different from that. All of us experience that kind of thing. So it's when it becomes more enduring, more, more chronic, that we refer to it as um, dementia. And do you have the next slide? I think, but yeah. So this just shows the many different causes in this Believe me, many, many more than is on this slide, but you see Huntington's disease is one of the causes. Alzheimer's disease is the most frequent cause of dementia. Parkinson's, and it on and on, low blood sugar can cause a dementia syndrome. I wanted to um, let you know that you, we don't go from zero to 100, so we don't go from no dementia to, to dementia. There's this intermediate stage we call mild cognitive impairment, where a person is showing some forgetfulness and so forth more than normal, but they're still independent. They're still able to manage their daily affairs. And research is focusing more and more on this mild cognitive impairment phase. We want to get to people and implement strategies before they're no longer going to be able to be learned or a person will be able to benefit from them. So. So Felicia, this is a question that I have for you. Um, I was always under the impression that dementia and Alzheimer's were separate. I didn't realize that they were under the same umbrella. Um, can you just explain that just a little bit, why there's that perception? So uh, it is, uh, Alzheimer's disease is a form, is a, an example of a dementia syndrome, but dementia really is a global term. When a person says that their family member has dementia, the next question is, well, what is the dementia from? And um, that's when you will hear, oh, they've been diagnosed with Huntington's, they've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So it really is just, um, I guess an example would be, you have a fever. You say to someone, My, I'm running a fever. Well, that's nine million causes of a fever, so then you wanna go into, well, what's causing that infection kind of thing, so. Yeah, and I just also wanna say a little bit with, um, you know, dementia is really, brain cells not working. Um, and with the different forms of dementia, we see different parts of the brain affected differently. So depending on what is actually going on in the brain is going to affect what the symptoms that we see are. And so things like, um, like Parkinson's disease, Primarily, Parkinson's disease has more motor symptom function because that is the part of the brain that it, it basically targets. But we do see then cognitive impairment and some dementia symptoms within Parkinson's. Um, the same thing with Alzheimer's disease. Your, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Felicia, <laughs> but the, um, you know, the frontal lobe and that short-term memory, and um, that is one of a main part that's um, affected. When we look at like vascular dementia, those are many strokes happening in the brain. So depending on where those are happening, that's then going to affect what part of the brain the functioning is affect the symptoms coming from. And so with Huntington's disease, um, down in the caudate, Am I pronouncing that correctly? Caudate, you know, basically the pathways for like those messaging pathways is what is affected in Huntington's disease. Again, these are kind of primarily groupings. And so the pathways going to our frontal lobe that has a lot of our thinking, our judgment, our evaluations, our um, emotional regulation, all of that, um, those pathways that order and organize that information are affected. So we may remember, so an individual with Huntington's disease, and we might get into this a little later, you know, remembering the components of how to tie your shoes. You know what shoes are, you know how to put shoes on your feet, you know what laces are, you know how to tie them. But when you are trying to go to do that, the order of the steps 
the initiative of what do I start with first, those are the processes that are affected. And so it then makes it difficult to just put your shoes on because figuring out and organizing how to do that is the part of the brain that is primarily affected. Just kind of for some examples. Um, we had a question come, oh, sorry, did you? We had a question come in um, that says, so do you find that some people exhibit lapses in judgment before they exhibit memory issues that would show up in MOCA scores, for example? Can oh, these okay. individuals still get a dementia diagnosis? Yes, so a long time ago, to even diagnose Alzheimer's, you had to have memory impairment. Now we know that there are different presentations, even of Alzheimer's. Some patients start out with primary language problems, for example. So yes, it's very possible to have one domain particularly affected early on with the other domain relatively intact. And you'd still be called, um, you could still be given a diagnosis of dementia because that impairment is affecting your everyday abilities. Yeah. And that's the key to dementia. It's affecting your everyday ability and in instrumental activities of daily living taking care of your checkbook, taking care of um, higher order kinds of things, cooking, traveling, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. yeah. So we kind of wanted to, because we're going to focus on that memory loss and I think probably a lot of that short-term memory loss and how that then does affect our judgment and emotional regulation and conversations and communication. Um, so we wanted to define the terms of learning and memory so learning is really that ability to acquire new information. We hear information, we learn it, we remember it. Um, we're, um, and then it also can be modifying existing information. So we're learning about a topic and we have a base understanding. We get more information that either alters our the existing information that we know about that topic or it enhances it so we get a deeper understanding. So that process of getting information in is that learning process. And then the memory really refers to the ability to recall, the ability to um, bring back up that information that's previously learned. So they go hand in hand, and I think one thing to think about with memory is that when we have previously learned information, and then we have some memory impairment, if we learn new information, we're not always able to put it together with the previous learned information because, you know, depending on if that stayed in our memory or not. I don't know if you had, I don't know if you had anything to add on that, Felicia, or if I did an okay job. <laughs> you did a great job, really good. Um, if you wanted to show the next slide. Um, uh, so really the part, obviously, all of you in here, I'm sure, are aware the striatum is the structure that is um, involved with uh, Huntington's. For a long time, we thought that the stri and if you could show the next one. Yep. The, for a long time, we thought that the basal, I'm sorry, the basal ganglia is the um, region. It's, it refers to a bunch of different structures shown there. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So that's this, the uh, basal ganglia. For a long time, we thought the basal ganglia was just involved in the movement disorder, that that was what caused the Huntington's chorea. We now know that it's very, very, very critical for cognition and thinking abilities. You show the next slide. I think um, you were getting at this earlier. This just shows you arrows going from the basal ganglia to all different parts of the brain. It's not just that one structure that's affected. You know, the brain, you see pictures like temporal, frontal, you know, occipital low pictures. It's, it sort of implies that these are discrete structures, they're not. The brain communicates with each other. And what you were saying earlier, those connections going to the frontal lobes are so critical to memory because um, it invo does involve in planning and particularly attention. Um, a lot of times I'll see patients come in and tell me they're having memory problems. It really turns out that their attention's not good. It's not their memory. They're not getting the information in and paying attention to it. And that's the kind of thing that those arrows pointing to, those regions of the brain are so critical for memory. So. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to skip that. That's way too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so before we go into kind of some of the strategies, um, and you kind of touched on this a little bit with um, looking at what is causing the memory loss, Felicia, but is there any way to actually like reverse memory loss? And we'll go into strategies, but is there any way to reverse a memory loss that is occurring? I think there is. Um, there are some strategies we can adopt. Um, again, the idea of attention, paying attention to what we're trying to learn is so critical to memory. Also, um, at uh, Emory, we, do, we have a cognitive empowerment program where we do teach uh, strategies to people to try to compensate for memory loss. So there are times that we can reverse, but I really think the more appropriate term that we try to get at is to compensate. You know, we're not trying to change, we can't change the way the, the brain, the loss and so forth in the brain, but we can give people strategies for uh, making their memory less pronounced and making, it, uh, making them able to better function every day in the environment. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is that a lot of the dementias or a lot of the things that are causing memory loss, because it's destruction of brain cells, we're not going to regenerate those brain cells necessarily. Right. We're not going to get those back, but there are some strategies that, that can help. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions that I know has been asked a lot with me before is, and you touched on it a little earlier, but um, I forget my keys sometimes. I, you know, sometimes there's things that are, um, I was just talking with someone earlier, you know, sleep deprivation, or um, I work a lot in grief and loss, and grief can have major components on our memory um, and affect our abilities for memory and learning. Mm -hmm. How do I know that it's not just my daily memory issues or forgetfulness? And how do I know that it's maybe something that is a little bit more substantial? When it becomes uh, an everyday occurrence is one clue. If you keep doing the same thing over and over and keep losing your keys or keep um, leaving the stove on, things like that, then there may be more of a problem. All of us have um, issues with lapses in memory and. Um, the other day, my neighbor um, came to my door and asked me to call her because she lost her cell phone. Mm -hmm. Things like that. I mean, all of us here, I'm sure, uh, have that experience of losing things. But when it becomes noticeable to other people in your family and they're getting a little bit concerned about you or it's starting to interfere with your ability to work um, and others are commenting on it, then, then it requires um, work up by a clinician and trying to figure out what's causing that. Again, it could be something that's treatable and reversible. So that's the important point to get in there. And, and if you are concerned, I always tell people, you know, um, I deal a lot with geriatrics and patients will come in and say, you know, I told my doctor I'm forgetful and I'm worried about it. And he said, oh, you're just getting older, don't worry about it. But we know ourselves better than anybody. Subjectively, if you feel something's wrong, get it checked out. You know, uh. Yeah, I realized too that um, one of the things I wanted to kind of mention is an example I use, um, and those of you that might have been listening yesterday will hear this again, um, but an example that I use to kind of go through the different types of memory, um, because I think it's important to recognize uh, when we have memory impairment, there are different types of memory, and so there are different ways that memory can be impaired. So one of the examples I use, and please feel free to step in and you know, correct me if, because <laughs> I am not the neuropsychologist. Um, but one of the things I talk about is when there is, so say your brother calls you up on the phone and you're having a conversation with your brother, back and forth, how's your day, all, the, all those things. Um, that's an immediate memory that's at work. You know that you're talking to your brother, you know that you're having a conversation on the phone, back and forth. Later that evening, the next day, your significant other, hey, did you talk to your brother yesterday? No, I never talked to him. That's more of a short-term memory, um, not remembering, or I, maybe I talked to him, but I think it was like five days ago. You know, And so that's more of the short-term memory at work is not necessarily remembering things um, from a couple days ago or, or a, a short time period in there. Um, there's also then, um, a um, long-term memory, and the long-term memory, something like your brother lives in 
um, California. He's lived there for 10 years, 20 years. You always talk to your brother. He moved a year ago to New York, and he calls you up and you say, oh, hey, have you been to the beach lately? Because you think of him as living in California, because that's your long-term memory is where he's lived, and you then, your short-term memory is impacted um, with the recent move. And then there is also an emotional component to memory. I'm sure I don't have to tell any of you that emotions are very strong, um, and emotions um, really do a lot of things for us, um, and sometimes they're really hard to manage. Um, so when we have this emotional memory, when we have an emotion attached to a memory, so your brother calls you up and says, I'm gonna be a dad. You're gonna be an uncle for the first time. You may forget a lot about around that time period, you may have a lot of memory loss, but you remember that conversation. And when you had it, you might remember what you were wearing, you might remember where you were sitting, because there is a very strong emotional attachment to that memory. Um, so that is an emotional component. And then we also have like a procedural memory. And the procedural memory is something that stays intact a lot of the times when we're working with um, patients with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia um, because they can remember those steps, like I said, of tying on, putting on your shoes. You can remember how to... Um, a lot of times because the procedural memory is intact, it can mask other signs of memory loss because somebody can remember how to get to the store around the corner and they can keep driving as long as they go that exact same route. But the minute there's something, a barrier, because there's road work and they have to go a different way, they get lost. And so it's because of that procedural memory staying intact, but the other forms of memory are not, and so then it's affected when there's a disruption to that procedure. And I'll just um, weigh in because with my husband, Blake, you can ask him pretty much any baseball statistic for the Cubs up until 2016 when they won the World Series, and he can tell you anything you need to know. Um, sometimes tying his shoes, he has a difficult time with it. So um, I can talk about what we do with his shoes in a little bit with strategies, but that's, that's where I see the, the issues with his short-term memory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thanks for that. And we have a question that came through. Um, it says, my son is in advanced stage HD. I can tell him the same thing every day, and he never remembers. When a doctor tells him to do something, he doesn't forget. Is it memory loss or that he just doesn't want to listen to me? <laughs> um, go ahead. I was just going to say I was in a session yesterday, and they were saying that sometimes with um, HD patients, it's that the mom is too close to the patient and that somebody different, whether it's a best friend or a doctor or even their parent, sometimes that will get through where they just sort of hear you, I'm uh, kind of aging myself with Charlie Brown and the, the teacher where it's like wah, 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 wah. Yeah, that's what they hear. So maybe that's part of it. Yeah. So do you want to agree totally? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. That's a great point is that, you know, when you think about, we talk about where are we at our worst? Where do we maybe let our emotions down? Where do we, we do them in our safe places. And so we do them with our spouses. We do them with our kids or with our moms or our dads, you know. Um, oftentimes as parents, if you're parents, you know, you think about, where do the kids do the tantrums? They do the tantrums with you, not at school with the teacher. They do them at home, and you're like, what is that? Um, so really, there is a safe place component to that. Um, the other thing that I will say, and that I work with um, a lot of caregivers in my memory care facilities, is that because there um, there's emotional ties to memories, and I don't necessarily think this is the case in this situation with this question, um, because we're not in that advanced stage of dementia to where there's that lack of awareness that obviously this is his mom and things like that. But um, in general, there's also sometimes components to this person is always asking me to do something I don't like to do. And so with caregivers, you know, I say I have the great job. I just get to sit and talk with people and we look through their pictures and we kind of just hang out. I don't have to make them get in the shower. I don't have to make them change their clothes. I don't have to make them do any of that. And so when I approach them, it's this, oh, I, I like this feeling. This is a good thing because that's that memory that they know that, like, she's not going to make me do anything, even if they don't remember who I am. 
But with caregivers that do come in and every morning they come in and they make me get in the shower, well, the shower's cold. I don't like that. And so they see that caregiver and they're like, that's a that's not a good feeling. And so again, that emotional tie comes in there. And so I think, and so again, not that the son is not recognizing you as a mom, but you know, there's this factor of my mom's always telling me things and she's always trying to make me do things. And so um, a lot of the times it is really great to have a doctor, have a trusted friend, social worker, counselor, somebody that can kind of be in your corner and on your side to give that same information um, because we all tend to listen to it from somebody different than that person that's closest to us. Yes, I was gonna um, highlight what you say. Um, when we take away have to take away driving privileges from someone, we always have the doctor be the one to say it, not the spouse, because then the spouse can say, it's not my decision, it's, mm -hmm. the doctor said don't drive, you know, and that's really important to try to take away some of that so that you're not the bad guy all the time. Yeah. And I'll just add to that, my husband um, has recently stopped driving as of this year. And we didn't, Dr. Factor didn't have to talk to him about it. I was actually going to have Dr. Factor talk to Blake about it. Um, more because I was worried about him injuring himself or someone else, not necessarily his ability to drive. But Blake made the decision on his own. So sometimes he still has the ability and the HD patient still has the ability to make the decision on their own. I would have called in reinforcements had I needed them, and I was going to blame Dr. Factor, 100%. So. Yeah. 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 yeah, let's click forward and start talking a little bit maybe about some strategies. So I don't know, Felicia, if you'd like to kind of go through some of these strategies that you've seen in your clinic, and then we do have a couple questions that we'll kind of talk that, sure. um, that play into this. So one of the things that I've been um, teaching patients to do for many years now is to use a notebook calendar system. Very simple. It's a calendar. Uh, it's, it's organized by month. You can get day timers, things like that. Our calendar has a, an appointment list on the left, a to-do list on the right, and then things you want to remember. Even the example you gave earlier of, of um, the brother calling and saying we're going to have a baby, et cetera, that's something that could be put in the memorable moment section. But I'm a firm believer in note-taking. Sometimes people think um, that if they start taking notes, if they start writing things down, they're weakening their memory. That's not at all the case. External strategies are so critical to memory. And having everything in one place is important, too. A lot of times, People will use, um, you know, little notes everywhere. Not a good, th not a good idea. Also, um, having different calendars all over the house is not good. I, I recommend one calendar, preferably something that you can carry on you and take with you in your purse or your back pocket, so that when something does come up, you can write it immediately in your calendar. The other thing we teach people is to put check marks. So, um, if you a meet with a friend for lunch and it was an appointment at noon, after that's done, you immediately check it off so that when you go back sometime and you say, hey, did I ever do that lunch? It's obvious to you. We try to take the memory off of people. Um, so, and I like this kind of calendar because I know the old Hallmark ones where you had the little boxes. You can't write anything in there. And people will say, well, I use my phone. Well, phones are good, you know, they have little reminders, alarms go off, tell you, oh, it's time to do something, but you can't really write a whole lot in a, in a, in a phone uh, calendar. So I, I, I'm a firm believer, and this has been so impactful in our patients. Um, they really at first thought, well, it's so simple, what do, you know, it's ridiculous, why do I have to do this? But eventually, a lot of them started using this, and it also helped their caretakers, because the caretakers, told us that they had less burden on them. You know, there's so much burden in, remember, in reminding someone all the time about something, or did they take their medications, et cetera. It makes the person feel more empowered using the calendar, and it makes the caretaker have less burden, feel responsible for having to do all of that. Yeah. 
Um, and I am the caregiver. Um, Blake has a really hard time writing. Um, so we don't use a whole lot of him doing the calendaring. But I do have a calendar that I keep with memorable moments for Blake. Um, I will write things down and I'll put it on a post-it note for him. The calendar that Felicia's talking about is kind of helping me to help him. Because Blake, um, he'll write a note and I may not understand what it says, but if I know what he's trying to say, he can articulate to me. I'll put it on a post-it note. I'll stick it on the refrigerator or somewhere where he will find it. But then I have the calendar to remind me, okay, tomorrow's his friend's birthday. I need to remind him because he would really want to say happy birthday to his best friend. So that's how I keep sort of manage him as a strategy, not so much for Blake, but for me, because then I've got all this other stuff as a caregiver. Those of you who are caregivers know you've got all of your stuff, all of your, if you're working, you've got all your work stuff, all of your family stuff, and then you have this extra person that you want to keep as independent as possible, as long as possible, and so that's how I kind of manage it. Post-it notes, I love them. And I know you don't love them for that. Well, <laughs> only because they, they fall off, they're all over the house. You know, I like to keep everything, we call it consolidation when we teach the calendar, everything in one place. And I think the strategy you're using is great. It's a combination. The, yeah, and the other thing that we um, tell couples to do is in the morning when you sit down for breakfast or in the evening, go through the calendar together. Say, wait, let's, what do we got going on tomorrow? And keep it so that the other person can say, um, can see what you're doing. And um, they can keep the calendar too. They can open it up and you could, they say, do I have an appointment tomorrow? You could say, check your calendar. And then they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we do. So as much as you can empower somebody and you know, make them feel independent, the better, I think emotionally. Well, and I think too, oh, I was just gonna say, I think too that you make a good point with um, the fact that you said earlier that sometimes people think that if I implement these strategies, am I hurting my memory because I'm not causing it to work as much? And I think it's a really good point to think that these are tools to help your memory. You're not just gonna go and fix a car without any tools and say, well, it's gonna just keep running as long as it does. So these are actually tools to enhance your memory and maintain that memory. And they're, they're because again, as we kind of were talking earlier with the shoes and things, I always encourage people, the more that you as a caregiver, the more that you as a, as a provider can take the organizing, can take the, um, the, you know, take away some of that having to think through the organizing and the identification, the more that you can take those complex functions away so that really there's a very clear set of guidelines, there's a very clear calendar, there's a very clear set of um, pictures to point to, very clear choices, you are, are really taking a lot of those executive functions, those more complex functions away to allow your loved one, to allow um, the individual to then continue using the skills that they still have. When you're asking them to do all those other functions when those skills they really don't retain anymore, it's putting undue pressure on them and undue pressure on you because you're trying to make something happen that's just not functioning because the brain cells are not functioning in that way. So, yep. so the calendar's been a big success and I've really seen it being very impactful. And you know, there are electronic things too. There's Google Home, for example. Um, there are other, so many electronics out now. Um, I'm a little bit technologically challenged, but you know, there's also uh, there's so there's the Google Home. There's um, reminders that can come up to you. There are there are finders you could put on your keys. Um, there's just a lot of um, technology out there now too to help. And you just made me think, and I can't, I know, we're not necessarily a product endorsement, but I can't remember the name of it, so it's not a complete product endorsement. There are actually calendars that you can go on and you can basically create your own calendar. So they have different templates or they have different ways of how you would want to use a calendar. And you can actually customize your own calendar based on do you want a to-do list? Do you want something with times on it? Do you want a notes section? Do you want 
all of these different options. So you can go on and customize a calendar specifically for you and your situation. Um, and um, uh, sorry, I forgot what the other point I was going to make. So I'll think. I'll see if I think of it later. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the best the the in the Alzheimer's field, particularly the most effective cognitive strategy for helping memory has been exercise. Um, all the, there are so many clinical trials going on now showing the benefits of physical exercise on brain functioning and on improving memory functioning. So really the um, reasoning behind the physical exercise is that it increases blood flow and the saying is what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So increased exercise produces increased blood flow, produces increased blood flow to the brain, increases cognition through oxygen, nutrients going to the brain. Um, do you have, yeah. I was just gonna add that um, Blake um, was a runner all through high school, college, and so he was always physically active. Um, later in life, his knees got really bad, so he's a biker. And as his disease has progressed, he has been unable to ride the bike as frequently. We've had to put some restrictions on him, but that's still in his schedule. He has a schedule. He still exercises almost every day. Um, his roots are shorter. His time out there is shorter. He's on a greenway path as opposed to the roads now, but he is still cycling every, just about every day. Yeah. And that's a great example, Lori, of just adaptation and just recognizing what abilities are still there and what abilities can um, can I still do, can my loved one still do, and let's then put scaffolding, put supports around that in order to continue to um, help them be as independent as possible. And I think um, in my work with HD families and with um, just dementia care patients and things like that, um, some of the most adaptable and resilient. And I think that oftentimes we don't sit and you guys don't look at how much you've already adapted and how much you've already put into place in order to assist your life and your loved one. And I just think that sometimes it's good to take that step back and look at maybe six months ago or a year ago where it was at and where it is now and what tools you've already put in place that you probably don't even recognize are just amazing tools and supports that you're already doing. So, and I think that, um, I mean, we've said it a lot and you set it in with your schedule with the routine. Routine is so important. Um, it's so important to have that schedule, to have that routine, to go through that process. Um, and it can seem monotonous sometimes to some of us, I think, and sometimes we get to where, well, won't this seem boring or we're doing the same thing every day? But in reality, I always encourage people to, is it working? Is it, does your loved one feel distressed by anything? Or usually that routine and that foundation actually enhances their ability to remain calm. It enhances, um, because again, when things disrupt a routine, um, we talked about the going to the store earlier and things like that. When there is disruptions, when there's distractions, um, that's unsettling because when someone's brain is not functioning, they don't have anchors. They don't have foundations that then they can reorient to very easily because those aren't necessarily functioning. And so when we get out of a routine, when something is just different, it can just be really um, overwhelming and it can be confusing and then it can be a really hard time to calm down with that because our brain does not have that foundation to then rely on. So they, we talked a, a little bit about um, this, uh, but the frequency, um, they, it's recommended that uh, 150 minutes a week of moderately intense aerobic or 75 minutes of vigorous, it doesn't have to be done all at once. They recommend at least 10 minute uh, slots uh, to have show any benefit and also uh, exercises using um, strengthening exercises should be done more than twice a week. Next slide. The other thing um, that's been shown now in research is the benefits of eating certain foods on cognition and memory. Um, one of the ones um, that uh, we use a lot, next slide, at Emory is the Mediterranean diet. It's also good for um, hypertension, for lowering blood pressure, which again is, if somebody has those 
comorbid conditions along with Huntington's, it's gonna build on and infect the memory process. Basically, um, the, the key three things are fruits and beans and vegetables, very limited uh, red meat, red wine in moderation. Now people say, what does moderation mean? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, probably one glass of wine a night. At, uh, you know, I, but um, you know, you shouldn't, uh, you should be, be mindful of not uh, drinking a whole lot of uh, red wine. But red wine is um, particularly good for the brain. Um, and uh, the other diet I don't have up here that you may, may want to look up is called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D diet. And that also has a lot of good research behind it showing benefits on cognitive functioning. Um, one thing I tell people, there's a, um, a website I tell folks to go to, it's called PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. And um, you can get on PubMed, and then you can search a topic, and it will come up with um, research articles that a lot of times you can access just by clicking on them. So you can read up on a lot of these strategies and, and decide for yourself whether you think it's worth doing. But diet is something that we at Emory really uh, tell people. Um, it's one of our recommendations we make to people. And Felicia, there was a question that came through a while ago, and I knew we were going to get to this point. Um, so um, the question was specifically, how much of a role can nutrition play in protecting against the development of dementia? So this is kind of helping to enhance our memory and support it. Is there anything that diet can play for prevention? Yeah, that's a great question. And the field, as I mentioned a little earlier, that mild cognitive impairment stage, like even in Huntington's, you don't go from not being demented to being demented. There's a, fa a phase, and it can be a long time before someone really reaches that point of cognitively not being able to do anything. The, the literature, the research is now focusing on what we call the preclinical stage. We want people who are currently healthy, functioning well, where we can implement these strategies. And there are so many studies going on now where people don't have any symptoms of, of Alzheimer's, of other diseases, looking at the benefits of these things. And I can tell you there's evidence um, of the importance, for example, of cognitive stimulation, uh, engaging in puzzles, um, you know, challenging your brain, learning new things, social stimulation, all of this done before any disease process. There's evidence showing that it's never too early to start and it can prevent or even slow down or even, you know, make it maybe 10 years later. So there's so much good evidence coming out now mm -hmm. that non-pharmacological trials going on. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's important just to note in general with that routine, uh, nutrition habits, sleep routine, going to bed at the same time, having a nighttime routine, getting adequate sleep, um, you know, all of those enhance our health and wellness in general, whether we're a caregiver, whether an individual, you know, with HD, um, all of that is really, is really positive and everything is showing that just those healthy habits make a huge difference. And I was just going to say, Blake, as I mentioned, was healthy all up until diagnosis and post-diagnosis. Um, I do believe that from a person, I don't have any clinical evidence on this, but he always ate very well. He was always physically active. He never was over excessive in any of his food or drink. And he started exhibiting symptoms about 12 years before he actually started to have a lot more of the um, typical um, HD issues. He had a tiny little twitch in his finger for a long time. So I, whether or not the nutrition was part of it or whether it was just his repeats or whatever, but he took care of himself for a long time. And so as a strategy, um, eating healthy, um, I think did help him. So. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, no, we just wanted to put some funny things up there within uh, memory. And um, like I said at the beginning, and if those of you walked in, if there's any specific memory examples that you have, feel free to put them in the chat so we can talk through them. Um, so the I, I think everybody can see the slides up there and everything. So, um, and you can keep it on here. Yeah, I was gonna say the last one with the turtle and the hair, that one actually really resonates with me. Um, with Blake, and he can remember a lot of stuff um, from a long time ago. <laughs> well, and I think that's important to note that, again, when we took look at the executive functions in that frontal lobe of our brain, and we look at um, especially short-term memory. Short-term memory really influences everything we do throughout the day. Um, we need to remember um, what we did an hour ago, what we did, we, know, we need to remember and organize the steps and what we do first. So there's that initiation piece. Um, we need to remember um, when we're looking at a big purchase. We need to remember our budget. We need to remember what we're purchasing it for. We need to remember what type of uses we need to have for it. We need to remember, you know, okay, does it fit where I want it to go? Something like that. And so we see a lot of um, kind of some of those impulsive pur uh, purchases. A lot of it has to do with not being able to hold all of those memory items in our mind at the same time. So we just, um, we see something, we know, oh, we need that for this. So I'm gonna get it rather than evaluating all of the other pieces that we need to remember in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so sometimes the purchases are, are not appropriate or outside of our budget or things like that. Um, when we look at cooking and we look at needing to follow a recipe, we need to remember exactly where everything is. We need to remember what type of container it's in. We need to remember what it tastes like. We need to put it in the right order. We need to remember when they say, um, you know, when, when you're talking about, um, here, let's uh, whip this up. Well, what, what exactly is the consistency of whipping something up? And some people, it's like you can retain what that consistency is and what it is, but how to actually do it and what do I start with and then what do I go to next, those can be affected. So um, there's a lot of day-to-day day to day life examples where we are constantly using memory and so when those pathways are severed it then affects our judgment and our insight and our uh, initiative and all of those other other areas and i know um with blake he does much better with his memory and with everything if we keep on our schedule and i don't know if any of the other caregivers and or the patients are having a little bit of a struggle but even coming to convention is a little bit stressful for us because blake has a set he has a set day he wakes up he goes he eats his breakfast we take you know he takes a shower takes his medicine then we go walk our dog then we come back he'll watch tv and then a little bit later he eats this has thrown us off because we're eating at different times so it's been he's done great but i know that that is stressful um for his memory i i tend to probably overcompensate a little bit for him um i want him to remember the things but i also want him to feel empowered so i will take a lot of the processing out of it um like brianna was saying if I'm cooking something, I know the steps. I'll go through and I have to cook it anyway. I'll bring him in. He remembers how to stir. He knows how to put stuff in the pot. But I'll say, can you put this in? Um, he'll remember some of it and he'll remember to do it while I'm standing there. Would he remember to turn off the stove? Or does he remember how to turn on our gas stove? Maybe, but I don't let him do it. So just more for his safety. That I think is a safety issue. If it's something that I'm, he wants to do, that he thinks he can do, I, I kind of step in a little bit. A lot of the stuff, I let him do. He likes to water our grass, I let him water the grass. He remembers if it doesn't rain, it needs to be watered, he goes and water it. Yeah, so. I, um, something, something that um, we hear from our folks with uh, memory loss is 
they don't want to have responsibilities taken away from them. So any way that any any way that you can keep them engaged, some some way, is so important. And I love that you do things together, like cook and share some things together too, and, and let him do the things that he can do. Yeah. You know, it's great. Um, uh, Blake does know how to use my um, heat sealer. Um, my sister and I have a little side hustle, and so we make cookies. So we. Um, when we have a big batch, Blake is our heat sealer, so he knows how to do the buttons. So he he does remember things. So I just I like to let people know that you know he's still capable. He just may not be able to make the cookie, but he can certainly help with a process. So yeah, and I think we you know we said earlier, and that's really important to recognize. Um, that when we're looking at memory loss and when we're looking at HD specifically, um, because the pathways to mm -hmm. organize information and the pathways to, um, you know, figure out what is next, as well as sometimes, um, I mean, usually the identification is there, but trying to organize it and getting all that processed and then figuring out how to get it out in the right way, um, those are the processes that are affected. And so when you are able to recognize that it's maybe not even a memory loss, but there is a component to that um, initiative, and it's really about initiative. And so if you give that step, then, the individual retains that ability. I think about setting the table. You go and say, hey, will you go please set the table? Okay, what am I supposed to start with? You know. So if you say, can you take these forks and put them by each chair? Great, I can do that. Can you take the plates and put them by each fork? Great, I can do that. You know, And you do that one step at a time. Um, and you give that very clear direction. Um, you say, what do you feel like eating today? Well, I, I don't, what am I supposed to, you know, I, there's so many things then in our brain that we need to kind of process through. So again, if you take on that processing, would you like to eat this or this? I've had people make um, snack charts with little pictures and it's just on the fridge of what snacks are available and they just always keep those same five snacks available. And so there's always those snacks available and they can point to a picture that helps one with Again, you're organizing, you're taking those steps and that, that executive processing um, onto yourself and creating a system, whether it's you or whether it's a chart or, or something like that. Um, it also will help, um, this is kind of side note, but with communication, as communication gets more difficult with progression with HD, picture charts, um, putting people's pictures by phone numbers and having that chart up, all of that is really helpful because then you can point and you don't have to you know, verbalize, so. And I was just gonna say, as a caregiver, I wanna, I have not been the most organized person. I know where everything is, but I may not be able to tell you where something is. So as his disease is progressing, it is forcing me to be more organized because he may want to find something, the nail clippers, um, you know, a, a post-it note or whatever. So now I have a system where the post-it notes are always in the same drawer. I can walk him, if he calls me or needs me, I can say, go to the kitchen, because our house is an open floor plan, and I can say, right next to the refrigerator is the drawer, that's where the post-it notes are. If he wants to have um, you know, something to eat, my pantry is now organized where I can tell him it's on the second shelf on the left side. I may not know exactly where it is, but I have everything sort of organized where I will allow him, he may not be able to remember that, but I know where it's supposed to go. I need to remember where I put stuff and put it back in the right place. So that's kind of the, that's kind of hard. Yep. We didn't get to this, but um, one of the other things about memory strategies is the importance of being organized and decluttering the house as much as possible. Um, you know, getting rid of the clutter, papers, magazines, things lying around, keep it simple, and also putting things in the same place all the time. Always having the keys in a, in a, by the door, you know, always having your cell phone by whatever part in the kitchen. That's a really critical um, strategy as well um, for memory to improve that. So we have a question that came through a little while ago, um, and um, it's talking really specifically more about later stage, like when 
when individuals have the physical ability to use um, but no longer recognize everyday items such as a toilet or how to use a spoon, what strategies can we use to assist them in the use of these everyday items? And I have a thought, but I'll see it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, one of my thoughts is that um, do it with them. People modeling, modeling is great. Um, when you are working alongside somebody, they can watch you and follow the steps that you're doing. So the more that you just come alongside and do some of those everyday steps together, they can follow along with what the steps are. That's a really good strategy. I'm not at that stage yet. Um, we have a question in the room. Um, but yeah, I would do the same thing. I would probably model um, what I would want Blake to do. Um, I was going to make a comment about the two batteries. Uh huh. Uh, we have a question or a comment in the room yeah. about okay. using the commode. Can everybody hear? Okay. I'll, I'll repeat it. Commode seats that allow them to identify the commode white on white on white or beige oh. on That's a really good point. Bright colored commode seats, then they will continue to be able to identify it as a commode. Got it. Okay. So the um, the comment was about um, the toilet and the commode and. Um, using something contrasting um, on your seat so that it's easier to identify because if you've got white on white on white it's a lot harder to identify and I think that's a good strategy also to think about um, when we're looking at identification um, you know we've talked about calendars things like that there can also be color coding um, and and identification systems and I'd like to just also say that the more that you implement systems earlier <laughs> and have them happening earlier, the easier it is to then maintain those systems as well as just make slight adjustments. Because oftentimes, again, HD is progressive, it is pro and memory loss is progressive, dementia is progressive, and it, it, it's not just progressive in it's gonna change in a month. It's gonna continue to change, you're gonna continue to need to alter things. And so if you already have a system in place, um, kind of like the biking example earlier um, that Lori shared with Blake, you can make slight adjustments and continue to maintain that because your base foundation system is already in place. Yeah, one of the, another strategy that is helpful for memory is to make things big and bright and loud, we teach people. So you have, for example, your laptop, if it's black and it's on a black counter, it's gonna be hard to find. Well, there are covers you can get on Amazon for your, that, you know, really nice, colorful covers for your set your phones for your um, laptop that make them stand out I think anything that makes something stand out you can get keys now like at ace hardware that are bigger than the typical small key so there are lots of strategies that just everyday things that can be done to I have an eyeglass case for example that's in a big yellow eyeglass cover um, so I can find it in my purse more easily Things like that, just simple, um, you know, adaptive strategies can help you find misplaced items a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So we have another question. It says, um, so there's the question and then an example that helps to highlight what, what they're meaning. What do you do when it is important for a memory to be correct, but you can't convince the person to agree? Um, so initially my, my thought was, well, um, does it really have to be correct? Because <laughs> that's something to kind of check yourself a little bit on like, okay, does this need to be correct? But the example um, gives a good example. So the caregiver, you need to take your medicine because you haven't today. The individual with HD, I took it already, so now I'm refusing to. Well, uh, that's where something like a calendar could come in handy. <laughs> Seriously, where you write, you've written it down, maybe even the person makes a little check mark or a dot or something. Well, look, you put this here. I mean, that's one idea I have yeah. where um, they're, you've um, in, written something so that they can see that they have taken it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have seen like the little pill boxes that actually have the daytimes. 
those, I mean, I don't know of a single person that I have that doesn't use those, <laughs> um, no matter really what your age. Because, I mean, all of us sometimes, did I take my vitamins today? Did I take? So um, implementing that pill box, I would also say to um, engage the person in the system. Yep. So ask them what will be helpful. Would you like to check a box or a race would you like to have like and where would you like it to live where would you like the medications to live have them in the exact same place every day and don't move them and have that system um, and ask them questions about what it is that they would like to do and I also think too um, understanding what might be going on and this is in a general kind of when there's refusal or when there's kind of that denial is kind of look at where the approach was, where the, was this the third time you asked them to do something that morning? Um, and they're just kind of feeling like it's, it's nagging, things like that. So kind of taking hold of that environment and taking hold of, you know, what other factors might be contributing to um, this than just strict memory loss. Because oftentimes there's other factors that are involved as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, um, depending on the pill, because you can't do this with everyone, I would do something like I would do with my dog and hide it in a piece of cheese mm -hmm. and say, here, have a piece of cheese. You know, um, it depends on what it is, though, because some of that you can't do, like some things you can't, medicines you cannot break up. But um, yeah, or I would say, if you take this, we'll go somewhere, you know, I'm not against bribing, um, but, you know, yeah, positive reinforcement. That's, that's a, thank you. That is what I was looking for. Um, but I have not had to do that yet. Blake is still able to take his medicines. I do ask him if okay. he's taken them because his memory is declining. But as of right now, he can remember to take his medicine. I have a problem sometimes where I think he takes too much medicine. Um, he has really bad allergies. And so I have to monitor that. Um, so yeah, so I, that's yeah. where I have my struggle. I, oh. no, I was just going to add, um, we, we use a phrase, um, don't sweat the small stuff. If it's something, like the example that person gave was excellent, you know, medicine you you can't, right. you know, ignore. But if it's something like, oh, we didn't go to dinner last night. Yes, we did go to dinner last night. Things like that, let it go. It's not important. But things that are critical, yeah. Battles. So just choose your battles, yeah. right, yeah. is what we say, yeah. too. And yeah. I think, um, Lori, that's a good, uh, when you talked about kind of um, if you do this, then we'll get to go here. Yeah. Um, I think that's something that we use a lot in in with my memory care. You know, we need to get dressed in order to do this. Yeah. Like you just, you know, the, the X then Y or is that the right X Y yeah. A then B. <laughs> um, so you know, it's okay to kind of incentivize some things sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's it's a strategy that gets used for sure. Um, so there's and a oh, the other okay. thing I was going to say is maybe if they have somebody else ask them if they've taken their medicine um, because it may go back to the thing we talked about in the very beginning where if I'm asking Blake continually all day did you do this did you do this he hears me as you know this little voice in the back of his head that's just static um, or like nails on a chalkboard and um, and if maybe somebody else would ask um, a a loved one or a daughter or son, you know, somebody else, you know. You're not the bad guy. Yeah, you're not always the bad guy. So I feel like the bad guy a lot. Yeah, so. Well, and I think that's important too because I was talking about this a little bit yesterday and actually talking about it earlier. Um, when, when we have more insight, when you have retained more insight into um, your own kind of uh, shortcomings, when you have more insight into your that you're not remembering things correctly and somebody points it out yeah. you already know and then you're really frustrated because okay now you're pointing something out that I already know that but as you as individuals um, as their insight lessens and if you have somebody that has less insight into their own abilities then it becomes a pointing finger then it becomes, well, it's your problem. Well, you did this, and that's why I did this. Well, the rug was in the way. Well, this was, you know, and it becomes 
that pointing finger because there's not as much insight. So again, looking at because the brain is so interconnected, sometimes there's a lack of insight factor, sometimes there's that lack of judgment factor, sometimes there's that lack of initiative, all those components play a role in it where it's not always just strictly a memory loss or it's not like a denial or trying to be difficult. And again, it's all the disease process and it's all the brain cells not functioning rather than the individual. And I have to say that sometimes um, sometimes I wonder if it's a memory issue or if it's apathy, um, whether he just doesn't want to do it and it's just me having to encourage him to do it. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is sometimes his short-term memory is really good um, and that throws me for a loop because I had an accident, I backed into a parked car, and I was hoping that was short-term memory, and yet I am reminded of that every single day. So, <laughs> so yeah, so it happens. Selective memory, that's what we call it. I know, is that just like a selective memory? I would say there's maybe some emotions that are involved in that memory. Well, that could be too. I'm worried about your well-being, that's the emotion, yes. <laughs> and his, um, he was there too. <laughs> so um, I know we're getting closer to end of time, but there's a couple just general questions about are there any medications that help with memory loss? And if so, um, do we know, how do we know when they would be useful? Uh, there are going to be some, um, all the sessions here I believe are taped, yep. and there are, were some dealing with some of the new medications that are out and the trials and so forth under the research. So those should be available to people to end of June. And um, we, we are not dealing with medications in this particular uh, um, meeting today, um, in our meeting, but there are some uh, things you can watch. And I think that, um, and um, following on what Felicia says, I think it depends on, you would have to go to your doctor and make sure that you are um, partnering with your HD professionals, your social workers. They will be able to help you because what's working for Blake may not work for your situation. You also may be, Blake's on several different medicines, so there's certain medicines that could interact with each other. So while I can say Blake is on XYZ, and you go to your doctor and say, I want to be on XYZ, or you want your loved one to be on XYZ, that may not be the right thing to do. Um, so that's where you really have to have a good relationship with the people, you know, your whole community. And um, HDSA may have some um, resources that you can use, but, um, you know, I would reach out to them if you don't have a care provider, but if you're in the HD, um, if you know you have HD, you've got uh, somebody you can go to, and I would ask them. Um, and then another question in general is, are there any recommendations for any easy home improvements that can help with individuals living with dementia? I, I would say in general, reduce clutter. Yeah. Um, you know, and we talked a little bit about organizing your pantry. I would say reduce clutter, reduce the amount of choices. Um, Get a routine for your weeknight meals and kind of keep it the same. Um, I think that, you know, we're running out of time, so we did have some on, like, just uh, caregiver burnout and things like that that we're not going to get to today. Um, but in general, give yourself a lot of grace and give yourself a lot of patience. Just recognize that um, there's a lot of things that are trial and error, and there's a lot of things that work until they don't. And then you got to figure out how to make them work again. Um, and so, um, but I would say in general, there, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into with caregivers as well um, in order to enhance your home environment and enhance um, just what your loved one needs. Uh, and so reducing the clutter, um, reducing choices, having set schedule for meals, limited snacks, things like that um, are all really, really helpful strategies um, for someone with memory loss, dementia, HD, um, just to really simplify life um, and, and know that that is going to enhance the quality of life um, in the best way possible. Yeah, and I agree with that. I, um, I use all kinds of things, and I'm addicted to Pinterest, so I will look on, up on Pinterest or out on YouTube or whatever you 
social channels. I look up a lot of things for organization. I have probably spent more money than I need to on organizing because some things do work and some things may work for Blake, but they're really hard for me. And so we've kind of have had to tweak some things. Um, but once we found what worked, I don't change it. It's the same. Um, my mom has a thing. She always likes to change all of our, her furniture around all the time. Once I get it set, I will never change my furniture. I will not change anything around. Um, the bed is set where the bed is. It will always be in the same way. So those are some other things that I think that I do that will take the stress off of me as well as him. And I think it's also important to note, you know, sometimes life gives us things where we have to change. We need a new car. We need um, some sort of new furniture because something gets stained, something gets broken. And so recognize that those changes will create an adjustment process. And um, sometimes it might mean walking back and forth to the bedroom multiple times and having that practice and that routine. And it'll take some time before it kind of um, gets in there. So again, giving yourself grace and giving your loved one grace when um, there are changes that sometimes are out of your control. Um, you know, that happen in there. Um, and so I think that that's an important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we recently had an issue with Blake where he gets confused at night getting up and going to the bathroom. So what we've started doing is shutting a lot of the doors that we may have left open. That way he, we leave the bathroom door open so that if he goes, he will only be able to get to the bathroom. He will not go into the laundry room where he may think he's in the bathroom and fall down. Um, so we've started to implement. That's new. Um, we had not had to do that. So like Brianne was saying and Felicia was saying, you're going to have to adjust. What we say right now, what I'm doing right now may not work in six months. But for right now, it's making our lives as patient and caregiver a lot easier. And another thought that I just had um, is think about the systems that are already in place in society. What does green mean? Green means go. What does red mean? Red means stop. So if you're implementing a system and you're wanting there to be kind of the, the green light cupboards or you're wanting there to be the green light direction, use the color green. Use something like that. And if you're wanting things to be a stop, use the color red. So thinking about systems that are already in place that we've known since childhood, putting things in alphabetical order, putting, you know, things like that can be um, helpful strategies because you're not recreating something, you're just using what, what's already available. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the comment was just, you know, because when you do write things down, when you put things in different forms, you verbalize it, you write it, we all have different learning styles. Um, that repetition can be helpful. So even if um, an individual with HD, yeah. their writing has difficulty to read, but it's but they want to write down, mm -hmm. um, have them write it down because they can even be thinking what they're writing, even if we can't always read it, and that's helping to solidify things in the brain. Yeah, and and not we do that. He'll write it down, but he won't remember what he wrote. Mm -hmm. So I, it's usually a three-step process. He'll write it down. I'll ask him what he wrote. I wrote it down again. Or write it down again so that he can see it. But, um, but yeah, that's because if I ask him, yeah, because if I ask him to write it down and I'll say, "What did you write?" He'll look at it and he'll be like, "Yeah, I don't know." Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what works for us. But yes, let them do what they can do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Again, that strategy of using your medical providers, using your social workers, using people other than you as a family member, to. Um, Make, say, state things like not driving or state other things that that are helping to enhance that quality of life um, and uh, maintain safety. So um, we are out of time. Um, we'll hang out up here if anyone wants to come and chat afterwards. But thanks so much for attending today um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.